Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks so much for coming today to listen to us all. This is a real privilege and pleasure to be able to speak at an event like this. Um, my name is Will. I'll be given the opportunity to speak to you guys about something called biomimicry. Just to give me an idea, how many of the audience here have heard of biomimicry? Maybe a show of hands. Oh, that's encouraging. OK, I'm finished. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. For those of you who haven't heard of biomimicry before, as a biomimic, what I do is I look at the natural environment for inspiration, whether it's adaptation or process, of how we can mimic or emulate the natural environment to solve human problems. What enthuses me about biomimicry is that it relates to nearly everything we do, whether you're an engineer, you're in energy capture, water purification, even if you're trying to solve office politics, there's some way that biomimicry can fill a role. The way that I became a biomimic in South Africa is something a little bit different. I actually grew up here. This picture on the right is a place called Swaledale up in Yorkshire in the UK. For any of you cheese enthusiasts, the next dale over is actually Wensleydale. Um, but I grew up just like everybody else as a young guy having really no idea what I wanted to do. From one day to the next, <laughs> I, uh, I wanted to be a pilot one day, a gardener the next, and then something else in between. But two things always used to stay the same. I always wanted to work outside, and I always wanted to do something that was important or that I thought was important. Now, being a Yorkshireman, I don't know if you've heard what they say about Yorkshiremen. They say, Yorkshiremen are born and bred, strong in arm and thick in head. Um, <laughs> I thought that uh, maybe joining the army was the way that I would do something that was important and do something that meant I could work outside. But actually, it never quite sat right with me. Believe it or not, I used to have the most bizarre, reoccurring dreams. This isn't going to get too weird. But um, I had this dream when I was younger that I invented the world's largest vacuum cleaner. OK, that is quite weird, I suppose. Um, not too dissimilar from this one. And um, with this vacuum cleaner, I'd I'd suck up all the excess greenhouse gases, but before I'd wake up, I'd not know what to do with it all. Um, but essentially, before I got anywhere, I finally got to university and fell in with a crowd of Kenyans who took me to where they come from, and then Africa slowly started to beckon. And then very quickly, I realized what I wanted to do was actually learn everything there is to know about nature. Fast forward a few years, I got into guiding. Fast forward a couple more years, in 2009 I was head ranger at Sabi Sabi and a lady called Janine Benyus, who, if you haven't heard of her, was or is the person who coined the phrase biomimicry in her book in 1997. She came with a documentary team to film something on biomimicry. And after three days of guiding her, I knew very quickly that biomimicry was going to have a profound impact on what I was going to do thereafter. A few weeks later, um, a lady called Claire Yanish, who a lot of you may have heard of, who started Biomimicry South Africa, contacted me and asked me if I wanted to be local naturalist for biomimicry in South Africa. Now, I'm quite dyslexic, so sometimes I get mixed up with different words, especially words that sound the same, so I wasn't quite sure what she was asking me to do. <laughs> but those creases got ironed out quite quickly, and, and then what came of that was an opportunity to have an adventure, to be involved in everything natural-based, whether it be marine or land, and teach people not just what they can learn about nature, but what they can actually learn from it. And that's what I'd like to do today. I'd like to give you guys a, an exposure to organisms, processes you may have come across before, and actually show it in a different light. Things that you may have seen in your backyard. I don't want it to be exotic species. One particular organism that used to fascinate me were dragonflies. Where I grew up, there was a pond where I lived, and every summer it was covered in dragonflies, dipping their tail in as they laid their eggs. And as I started to look at them... More recently, through a biomimicry lens, it opened a whole new can of worms. When dragonflies fly, they're dynamic, they're graceful, but they're also silent. And they've got two pairs of wings. Most flying insects only have one. And on the outside of each wing is this micro topography, a tiny microstructure. It's depicted in that middle picture there. And what they are, they're pinnacles or bumps that, as the air flows over them, create these micro vortices or whirlwinds act like rollers to pull a conveyor belt of air over it. So that even flying at very, very slow vo um, velocities, they can stay afloat. They essentially generate their own lift by pulling air across their wing. Those vortices fall off the back of the wing, collide, create larger vortices, and the back wings actually capture them. And they capture this free energy, this lift, to reduce their energy requirements, just like geese flying in formation. And a guy called... 
Hayato Abata from Nippon University in Japan actually started to incorporate them into micro wind turbines. Micro wind turbines get overwhelmed in high wind speed and don't operate that very well in low wind speed. He incorporated these bumps into the blades of the turbine and instantaneously the turbine started operating in wind speeds of less than one meter per second very effectively. And the flexibility of the, the blades actually at high wind speed, more than 25 meters per second, would curl into a cone so that they wouldn't actually be affected by the wind and they'd stop spinning, so making them much more viable for what they wanted to do. Other larger companies like Boeing and um, Anira, a French company, have been looking into how dragonflies might even revolutionize the way that Da Vinci and the Wright brothers thought that flight was possible in the first place. Now these organisms, like the dragonfly, produce these amazing structures that seem very fragile, but when you look closer, are very strong, extremely versatile, made from a small subset of protein-based materials like chitin and keratin, I'm sure you guys have heard of that before, and spiders are no different. They've, they've horrified most people, but wowed a few material scientists, especially their dragline silk. Some of you may have heard that their dragline silk is five times the strength of steel for the same density and 30% more elastic than anything we've been able to synthesize. But a team from Akron University in the States, headed by Ali Dolawala, have actually been looking at a completely different aspect. We've all seen it. We've all seen beautiful spiders' webs coated in water droplets after rain or went in high humidity. And I'm sure most of us have thought, oh my god, that's so beautiful. <laughs> but very few of us have probably thought, how the heck do they do that? Supporting all that additional weight, but keeping the same structure so it still fits the purpose. And when they looked at these strands at the molecular level, they found that each strand of silk contracts under high humidity and relaxes under low humidity, just like a muscle. But each one of those strands generates 50 times the work of a human muscle fiber. So you can imagine alarm bells started ringing on industrial applications, but more importantly, biomedical applications as well. So they're producing these amazing materials, but what really grabbed me when I was generating a lot of knowledge about biomimicry was how these organisms were producing these adaptations at body temperature and body pressure using freely available resources. We, unfortunately, often hold dear what we dig up or what we draw out of rocks at high temperature and pressure. Why can't we build our natural environment, our human environment, just like nature does, using something like carbon dioxide as a feedstock? Now, there's some companies that are looking into this, there's one co company called Novama, and they've developed a recipe inspired by photosynthetic plants to actually draw carbon dioxide from smokestacks and combine it with fossil fuels to actually produce what's called a polycarbonate plastic using an enzyme found in citrus peels. And what that does, rather than having a plastic that's 100% fossil fuel, they actually produce a, a plastic that is 50% fossil fuel, 50% carbon dioxide. Not ideal, I know, but definitely a step in the right direction. Conversely, there's another company called Calera, and Calera were inspired by the ocean. They looked at how corals were generating their own structure out of calcite by collecting the carbon dioxide that was dissolved in the water. We use limestone, ancient coral reef, dig it up, heat it to over 2,700 degrees Fahrenheit, and actually, in the process, produce one ton of carbon dioxide for every ton of cement that we make. Using the recipe by Calera, they estimate that by bubbling carbon dioxide through saturated brine, similar to the way that corals do, they would actually take out of the atmosphere half a ton of carbon dioxide for every ton of cement that we produce. So really inspiring stuff, people moving in the right direction, I believe. Well, what if we started putting all these pieces of nature-inspired innovation together? We could start to design these human environments that not only supported, but actually improved the greater surrounding natural environments. In biomimicry, this is the ultimate goal, and we call it creating conditions conducive to life. And that's what organisms do every day. Every single day, an organism does something in its environment. It actually supports it. It improves it. But unfortunately, as a species, we often degrade ours. What if buildings could capture their own energy? What if buildings could clean their own water and cycle their own resources, just like a tree? Collaborate these tree-like buildings into decentralized urban structures that operate like forests or savannas or coastal fainbos, depending on where you are, 
And slowly you start to blur these human-made boundaries between what is human and what is nature. And if we blur these boundaries, I really feel that we can start to have much more chance of surviving here for the long term. Conservation would become a necessity for industries, for new professions, because the secrets of their potential success may be locked away in what has to be conserved. In biomimicry, we refer to this as innovation for conservation. So hopefully you're starting to see that biomimicry is a pretty awe-inspiring and fascinating topic. I hope my enthusiasm comes across it actually delivering that. Um, I'm so proud to be part of it and extremely excited. My inspiration, my footholds to get me here have been unexpected. But one particular one that always stays in my mind is when I was 15 years old. I was back in Swaledale in Yorkshire on that first slide. And I was plodding around uh, a country market with my family, really uninterested. And out of the corner of my eye, I saw this stall that was covered in wooden eggs. I've never seen a wooden egg before. I don't know about you guys. And I went a little bit close, and they were, though, beautifully crafted wooden eggs. And on the outside, burnt into the surface were poems or sayings. And there's one particular one that caught my eye. It, was, it says, trees, rivers, and mountains at the top. And I read it, and immediately it hit a nerve. And the poem said, I've sat with all the major teachings on this world. I've also sat with trees, rivers, and mountains. When I've been quiet enough, the trees, rivers, and mountains have taught me more. Because whereas all the teachings hold the symbols of reality, trees, rivers, and mountains are reality. And even though it's very simple, it was very poignant. And for 11 years, that egg came with me everywhere I went, until in 2009 I gave it to Janine Benyus because I felt new inspiration had come unexpectedly from somewhere else. We all are inspired and apply our uh, inspiration in different ways. But one thing I've noticed is not that many of us get the opportunity to apply it directly to something we love day in, day out. I realized that what this world needs, what our generation needs, is passionate people doing what they love. That passion on a day-to-day -day basis is much more contagious and inspirational than any martyrdom of doing something you think the world needs. So the next time you're doing what you love passionately and you come across a stumbling block or indecision, maybe just stop for a second and think to yourself, what would nature do here? Thank you very much.